Good morning, everybody, um, and well done. We've reached the third day. Today, there'll be resurrection after the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, just want to welcome all of you here. <clears throat> the, um, this morning's session starts off with uh, one of our final uh, interlopers, as I call them. You know, um, we just, we've spent the last couple of days looking at issues around memory, around history, around commemoration. And uh, one of the strongest themes <clears throat> that have come out of the, of the, of the couple of days was the, the idea that uh, how to use memory for the, for the now, for the present, and for the future. And how should we engage with work that's contemporary, that perhaps relates to today uh, in either direct literal form or, or, um, or in fictional form. And uh, yesterday we had three contributions from uh, uh, the Central Statistics Office, uh, from the visual artist um, Mark, uh, Mark Curran uh, around the markets and from Carl O'Brien on direct provision. And this morning's, this morning's final uh, contribution to that contemporary debate is with, uh, with Tom Clonan. Now, one of, the issues that, one of the kind of issues that we're very interested in at the Abbey Theatre in, in, in creating work about over the next couple of years is, is around war probably one of the most obvious and constant themes of the 20th century, never mind the 21st century. And uh, uh, in 1916, of course, uh, Dublin and Ireland would have been considered a, a, a conflict zone. And so we're conscious, or we should be conscious perhaps, of what are the uh, conflict zones of today and what might be the conflict zones uh, in 2016 and how might the theatre and indeed the Abbey Theatre uh, make those connections with conflict zones abroad. I've, I'm traveling quite a lot internationally at the moment on that and just came back from, from Palestine where I spent some time uh, engaging with artists in Palestine to see uh, how they're approaching uh, through theater <clears throat> and through playwriting, how they're approaching uh, the conflict of, of that area and uh, uh, more of that and on. So just I'd like to welcome uh, Tom Clonan. I, I, I know Tom from a, from a different world that Tom and my father were colleagues together, uh, teaching colleagues together in, in, in DIT. But he is the Irish Times security analyst. He's a retired army officer, captain with experience in the Middle East and the former Yugoslavia. He's a lecturer in the School of Media in DIT. His first book, which is wonderful, um, indeed so is the second, but his first one, Blood, Sweat and Tears, was published uh, by Liberty Press in November 2012. His latest book, Whistleblower, Soldier, Spy, was published in 2013 and I had the honour to be at the launch of that book. Um, as a whistleblower, Tom's PhD research on female soldiers in the Defence Forces revealed unacceptable levels of bullying, sexual harassment and sexual violence against women in the Irish Armed Forces. His books detail his experience as a soldier in violent conflicts in the Middle East and Bosnia. Uh, his books also deal uh, with his work as a journalist in conflict zones and indeed his work as a, or, or his experience as a father as well of a young family. And of course, Tom has been in the news in the last couple of days, very busy, uh, uh, quite rightly advocating and, uh, on, the, on the whole issue around the CR, CRC. So uh, uh, we have, uh, we're, we're, we're here with you in solidarity on that as well, Tom. Uh, and of course, his work deals, of course, with memory, trauma, loss and grieving. So I'm delighted to welcome uh, Tom Clonan, who's making his debut on the Abbey stage. Thank you, Fiuk, and uh, good morning. Um, so as Fiuk said, uh, Captain Tom Clonan is my name, as no doubt you can tell from my military bearing, an unmistakable carriage. <laughs> um, so on, on, the, on the subject of memory, um, I served in, in the Middle East and in the former Yugoslavia as, a, as an officer in the Irish army, uh, an army of this republic, which, which have been very good ambassadors for the state and I think embody the, the, the notion of real citizenship in what they do overseas. But if we take the Lebanon, or Lebanon as we call it, the Lebanon, um, people are aware of it, it, it's entered into our language, the Leb and 69,000 uh, tours of duty uh, have, been, have been carried out there. And uh, there's an intimate link between Ireland and Lebanese people. But I, I feel that the, the general public don't fully understand what that means, what it means to be a soldier. So I wrote 
blood, sweat and tears in an effort to try and bring the reader to Lebanon. And it's based on my experiences there in 95 and 96 during a very violent uh, phase in the conflict between uh, Hezbollah and uh, the Israeli state. By the way, I should say, just by way of explanation, a Sisu is an armoured personnel carrier, <laughs> for reasons that will become apparent later. So, I, I went to the Lebanon as a young man. Um, I had no children. Uh, and it was a culture shock for me. And now, years later, sometimes when I wake at five in the morning and can't sleep, I think of Rashaf, Bait Shahoon, Shakra, Jumai Jumai, Majd al Silam. Those names as familiar to me now as Glasnevin, Fibsborough, Constitution Hill, the North Keys. Lebanese villages that I patrolled night after night after night during the winter and spring of 1996. I still recite the names like the sorrowful mysteries, sleeping, moonlit villages with whom. I became so intimately acquainted. I was based in Alyaton, and I arrived there in October uh, 1995. Spud pushes me out the door. You have to meet the Mukhtar. We crossed the vehicle park where a large black Mercedes is parked. A group of curious A Company troops have gathered to observe the formalities. The Mukhtar magnificently named Rafiq Haidar Hazimi, emerges from the Mercedes. He is ancient and has about him a retinue of heavily bearded and aggressive looking men from the village. Spud motions me forward. I offer my hand to the Mukhtar, but he does not respond. Instead, he is staring at me, open-mouthed. He looks to his entourage and speaks Arabic in a low, urgent voice. Then he addresses me. You are Captain Clunan? He asks incredulously. Uh, Lieutenant Clunan, I correct him. His eyes narrow. But Lieutenant Spud Murphy is big man. Very big man. Lieutenant O'Connor was a big man. Lieutenant McCarthy, he too was very big man. And Lieutenant O'Brien was very big man with red hair. <laughs> As he lists what seems like every Irish officer posted to Alyaton over the previous decade, the troops are pushing closer, enjoying the discussion immensely. One of the A Company privates is particularly helpful. Mukhtar, do you remember Lieutenant Ryan? He was six foot six. <laughs> the Mukhtar wheels around and points his bony finger in the air. Yes. Lieutenant Ryan, he was, he was very big man. At this point, the Mukhtar fixes his gaze on me once more. But you, you are a very small man. Smallest lieutenant in al Yaton, for emphasis, ever. <laughs> there is silence. The troops watch me expectantly. Then the Mukhtar seems to relent. Perhaps he feels that he has committed some social faux pas. He approaches me, and in a scene Straight out of Lawrence of Arabia, he grabs me in a sudden embrace. He kisses me on both cheeks and grabs my wrist. Gripping my hand triumphantly overhead, he shouts to all those assembled, Lieutenant Clonin is small man. Yes, this is the will of Allah. <laughs> but I tell you truthfully, he is very beautiful. There is an enthusiastic round of applause from the troops, <laughs> accompanied by loud whistles. Pleased with himself, the Mukhtar then joins us for coffee. And then it happens. At 05.05 on Tuesday the 31st of October, Hezbollah launch a dawn attack on five of the Israeli hilltop positions. They mount coordinated attacks on DFF-13, known as the Cuckoo's Nest and DFF-17, known as Hadata Compound, all in the Irish Battalion's area of operations. These Israeli firebases are directly south of al -Yaton. I'm in the communications centre when it happens. Psycho is talking to me when suddenly I can no longer hear his voice. 
A deafening roar drowns out his words. It happens so quickly that my brain is not processing the noise. And then, vibration. My body takes over, though, and I drop to the floor in a moment of reflex. Like when I was playing, like when I was a small boy, playing cowboys and Indians, taking cover. Only I don't do it consciously. The noise is so great, the vibration so violent, that I've done this involuntarily, adrenaline rushing through me, pins and needles in my fingers. I look up at Psycho. He is leaning over the desk, looking at me with concern. That's Katusha, sir. Outgoing. Relax, will you? You're making me nervous. The radios crank into life. I'm beginning to make sense of what's happening when a dawn chorus of new sounds commences. The cacophony of radio chatter is drowned out by a series of loud thuds. The floor is shaking, as though a giant was stamping his feet around the building. Now, even Psycho is crouched low. A split second later, we hear the deafening explosions, incoming fire. The Israelis are now saturating the area with defensive artillery fire, what is known as suppressing fire. The radio, slower than the speed of sound, slower than the speed of incoming rounds, announces, Gate 12 has opened fire. We fucking know that, says Psycho. The shelling rages around us for over an hour. Every few minutes, A Company troops fire red flares into the early morning light. This is by way of a formal agreement between the Israelis and the Irish. The flares are a mutually agreed warning signal indicating that direct hostile fire, intentional or otherwise, is impacting on our UN positions. The clattering of gunfire intensifies each time we send up a flare. They fucking know they're firing at us for fuck's sake, shouts Corporal Kennedy over the noise. Stop giving them a fucking reference point, will you? By 7 a.m. the firing has ceased. The radio chatter dies down. The Motorola returns to life. Proceed to the village of Atturi. Bodies in the wadi. Over. Corporal Kennedy perks up immediately. You're going to fucking love this, sir. Bodies in the wadis is Irish bat shorthand for a retrieval operation. After attacks on the Israeli hilltop positions, the Israelis sometimes allow for a short ceasefire in order that the bodies of dead Hezbollah fighters can be removed. The bodies are rarely intact, usually a bit torn up, as Corporal Kennedy puts it, due to the sheer weight of fire directed down the slopes and avenues of approach to the fire bases. Anyone caught in the open will draw a fire with catastrophic consequences. As we head for at Thierry, Corporal Kennedy fills me in on the gory details. If them bodies are out in the sun, so, they'll be fucking cooked as well. Fucking barbecued, all crispy. And sometimes they're full of gas, and you can't get them into the body bags. So someone has to burst them with a bayonet and let out the gas so they'll fit in. That's usually the officer's job. Corporal Kennedy is rooting around the backpacks and he hands me a bayonet from his Steyr rifle. Sergeant Begley interrupts loudly. Put that back or I'll burst you with it. Corporal Kennedy's cackling laughter recedes as he wriggles back into the hatch with the bayonet. I'm secretly relieved. We get to Hadata en route to Atiri. An officer from B Company is waiting near the graveyard at the edge of the village. There are a half a dozen so women keening loudly and ululating over the deaths of the two boys from Sidon. Their bodies are lying prone in a ditch just below DFF 17. At 12, we move up the track. At the junction of the track and the ditch, I dismount with Sergeant Begley. We escort the medics up towards the two bodies. Both are intact. Both have been stripped of weapons and other equipment by the Israelis. One of the boys has had his trousers pulled down around his ankles. The blood on his exposed buttocks and genitalia has blackened in the heat. His legs are similarly bloodstained, and blood has pooled and congealed around what remains of his trousers. His eyes are open. The other youth is lying on his back. His face has been blown off, and I notice his hands. Small hands, perfectly formed, unblemished by work or hard labour like a sculpture, the hands of an adolescent with his whole life in front of him. 
The medics work in complete silence. I'm amazed at how gentle they are. They work as a team to heft the bodies into two body bags. As the zippers buzz shut, the relief is palpable. We scour around for personal effects and the bodies are stretchered back to the Sisu. When we get back down to Hadata, the bodies are handed over. The women are screaming. The sergeant mutters, Jesus, Mary and Joseph. We drive in silence all the way back to al -Yaton. I'm sitting in the footwell of the Sisu writing a report as we head in. Corporal Kennedy is drinking coffee, his hands calloused with hate and love tattooed on his knuckles are shaking. April 1996, collateral damage. I'm in the back hatch of the rear Sisu as we head towards the village of Kana. Kufar Kana is where, as Psycho puts it, Jesus allegedly turned the water into wine. As we approach Kana, the streets of the small villages en route are deserted, the houses shuttered. The footpaths and alleyways are strewn with fallen masonry, which has been blasted off the exterior walls by shrapnel and machine gun fire. Wires hang in looms over the road, as many of the concrete telegraph poles have been shattered and broken by the artillery. We scan the road carefully for low-hanging wires and move slowly. None of us wants to be decapitated by a stray loop of wire. We keep waving at the Red Crescent Ambulance. It is an ancient Citroen, low to the ground, its suspension a distant memory. We give the driver the thumbs up for confidence. His hands grip the steering wheel and he keeps looking up, scanning the skyline for Israeli helicopters. We continue along the road towards the boundary of Irish Bat. As we round a bend, we see the remains of a car on the road. All that is left of the car, a silver blue Mercedes, is the engine block. It has part melted into the road surface. The burnt black metal congealed in tarmac. The driver, somehow, is still intact. Well, half of him is. Most of the upper body and his head, minus the jaw which has been blown away, is lying in the road, arms at silly angles, and his upper teeth, an image that remains with me, are stuck in the melting tarmac next to the engine block. It is an impossible arrangement. The car has been struck by a tow missile fired from an Israeli helicopter earlier in the afternoon. Bits of the Mercedes are strewn over the olive grove next to the road. The bonnet hangs from an olive tree some 50 metres away. Corporal Kennedy eyes me with malicious curiosity. Are you all right? He asks me mischievously. His sing-song Dublin accent, the accent of my childhood in Finglas, has a playful lilt to it. He is obviously recovered from the death of the 14-year-old boy in Brashit. This is different, I suppose. The victim is an adult, and we also suspect that he is Hezbollah. Corporal Kennedy whistles as he crouches over the body. That's his last meal. Eaten the fucking road by the looks of it. The Motorola hisses and squawks into life. Hello, 42 Alpha, this is Zero. Message, over. For your information and necessary action, Gate 14 Alpha has commenced firing into your grid location. Over. I tell Zero over the Motorola that we are removing the casualty to Tibnine Hospital. Roger, out, is the crackled reply. So we watch as the Red Crescent guys scrape him off the road. They carefully pried the teeth free from the tarmac and slide the remains into a body bag. Corporal Kennedy is sweating profusely. Once the whole sorry, sordid affair is over, he makes eye contact as we heave ourselves, weapons and flak jackets, back into the Sisu. He thrusts his face close to mine. He whispers fiercely, urgently, lighten up for fuck's sake. It's just a bad day at the office. We both laugh all the way back to Tibnine. All through that Monday night, the Israelis continue their attacks. Thousands of houses are destroyed in artillery and airstrikes. Tracer shells rip through the night blackness, mortars continuously thumping as they are launched from the Israeli firebases on the ridgeline opposite us. We sense the long, lazy arc of their steep trajectory and tense up as the 120mm mortars crash heavily into the villages and tracks around us. Tank shells, with that signature slapping sound you get with flat trajectories, 
slam into buildings and outhouses throughout the night. The ground vibrates constantly. Night blurs into day. At first light, on Tuesday the 16th of April, we are requested to assist in the removal of dead and injured from the little village of Jumai Jumai. There is unexploded ordnance strewn throughout Jumai Jumai, and we liaise with the ordnance officer from battalion. They give us the thumbs up, and we proceed cautiously into the village. A group of elderly stragglers, stranded in the mostly deserted village, emerge blinking into the morning light. They are agitated and upset and are pointing, gesticulating, at a badly damaged house at the end of the narrow street. We dismount and move towards the building. Sergeant Begley is the first to enter the house. Its door is still standing, hanging on its hinges. He pushes past it and disappears inside. He is followed by Sergeant Bracken. I'm on the back hatch, checking in with battalion headquarters, when Sergeant Bracken backs out of the doorway. He is carrying the body of a small boy. The boy is wearing a little Kermit the Frog t-shirt, covered in dust. Kermit still waves jauntily, but the small boy is stiff with rigor mortis. I remember him from our day at Finbat Range. Sergeant Bracken carries the body of an older boy. Sergeant Begley calls out to us as they lay the bodies down gently on the ground. There's a whole family in here, not a mark on them. The Red Crescent arrived from Tibnean and one by one the bodies are brought out. All four children, including the little girl that we fed on our day. The little girl lies in among her brothers. The entire family is removed to the morgue in Tibnean Hospital. Later that same day, we are mobilised to render assistance in Khana to bring emergency medical aid and whatever other assistance we can give. We later learn that at approximately 2.08 p.m., the Israelis bracketed their artillery fire directly onto the Fijian UN position in Khana. Around 38 high-explosive anti-personnel rounds have impacted directly into the crowded post. 155mm artillery shells fired by the Israelis. As a consequence, 106 men, women and children now lie dead in the post, their charred, blackened and mutilated remains strewn about the position. A further 116 are seriously wounded. When the Irish arrive at the scene, the Fijians are punch drunk, in shock. The majority of the dead and wounded had been sheltering in one large building with concrete uprights and a roof supported by steel girders. The blast effect of the artillery rounds has literally rendered most of the victims around the concrete posts and the roof supports. Human remains and body parts hang from the ceiling and are pooled and intertwined on the floor. It is a charnel house, an abattoir. The shockwave effect of the high explosives has pulped the internal organs of those caught in the attack. Bones are shattered, bodies blown open, pink and blue viscera protrude from the bodies of children. Those who are standing are decapitated. Limb separation is another feature of the blast effect of the explosives. The heat effects are horrific. Many of the bodies are burned beyond recognition. One of the first Irish troops at the scene is met with an elderly woman carrying a decapitated infant her grandson. She pleads with him in Arabic to find his head so that he can be buried whole. Someone finds the tiny head. For the first hour or so, there is a frantic rush to help the injured and dying. The medical personnel perform miracles and save countless lives. They do so in near silence, moving among the victims, triaging, separating those who can be helped from the dead and dying. The rest of the troops, with little more than first aid training, move among the injured. They give help where they can and comfort where they cannot. Soldiers from Dublin, Mullingar, Kildare, Cork, Donegal move through the carnage. Whispered accents from all over Ireland, soothing the dying. And Khalid, 
He played Elvis Presley's greatest hits over and over throughout that day. And amid the chaos, Elvis sang, when I first saw you with your smile so tender, my heart was captured, my soul surrendered. The only other record we had was Frank Sinatra's greatest hits. That night, I listened to him sing Cole Porter's Night and Day again and again. It seemed to echo the blurring of night into day, the endless violence, the endless patrolling. A week later, I was at home, walking up Grafton Street. I deployed out of Alliaton on the first troop rotation within days of Kwana. March 2003. In the nights leading up to my mum's death, I lie awake in bed, thinking and worrying, because this is death in slow motion. Cancer. Not like in the Lebanon. I roll over very gently in the witching hours and put my hand on my wife's swollen tummy, and I feel the little feathery movements of my daughter in there. Tiny kicks, ripples across the skin surface. Little Leoden inside her, in her water world, new life. And then, just a week later, I get a call to go to the coom. Leoden is dead too. She'd stopped kicking and swimming, and now she is perfectly still. They induce her that evening, and unlike the other four births, it is a completely silent labor. No cries. No sound at all, just me and Leiden's mum and the medics. I hear the whispered phrase, cord accident. Naively, I had brought a red and white candy striped cotton vest for Leiden. It had been our favourite on the boys, but it won't fit Leiden. I can see that immediately. She is perfectly formed, but so very small. The nurses make a little dress for her from some floral curtain material, and we fasten it around her with a safety pin. The nurses give us a Polaroid camera and advise us to take some photographs. You'll be glad later. So in the dark in the delivery room, we take flash photographs of our little Leoden, already gone, already the grey lady. The nurses give us a small cardboard box with some towels. When you are finished saying goodbye, you can bring her to the nurse's station. We look after her. Finally, we place our little girl very carefully into the box. I arrange the towels and walk through the busy labour ward to the nurse's station, past women and girls clutching their tummies, past the anxious dads pacing the hall, holding the box that held our hopes and dreams. Two days later, we drive little Leoden to the Little Angels plot in Glasnevin Cemetery the tiny white coffin balanced on her mum's knees in the car. We drive in silence, stop at the red lights, go on green, on through Fibsborough and on to Glasnevin. A young man with a shovel over his shoulder meets us and walks ahead of us to the spot. He speaks gently to us and indicates where the hole in the ground is. Say goodbye in your own time, he says. Take all the time you need. The crows caw in the trees. The wind chimes chime in the branches. Leoden's mum weeps. Leoden's milk seeping through her black dress. And we place the little coffin so very gently into the wet soil. And placing Leoden there, the world keeps going round. It doesn't stop for even a moment. Revolving around the sun and spinning and drifting onwards towards whatever distant stars. But I am rooted to the spot. I cannot stand up. It is impossible to stand up and turn away and walk away to leave our precious little daughter in the ground like that. And I think of all of the other little bundles that I had seen as a young man in Lebanon. And I think of the Lebanese men and women I had seen at the edge of bombed out ruins, their shoulders stooped in grief and disbelief. And I think of how I have finally joined them as brothers and sisters in all of our weeping and sorrow and loss. And when I can't sleep for grieving, 
echoing back for me from all those nights in Alyaton. I hear Cole Porter. Night and day, you are the one. Only you, beneath the moon or under the sun, whether near to me or far, it's no matter, darling, where you are. I think of you, day and night, night and day. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, we have, we've run out of time, so I can go, I'm going to ask for two questions from the audience, okay, uh, before we head off. I, and it was worth, I didn't want to stop you, Tom, for very obvious reasons. It's a, it's a wonderful book, that first book, or both of them are, but I would encourage you to read it, because the connection, the reason we have Tom here is to remind us that, uh, and to acknowledge uh, the impact the Irish Army have had, uh, a positive impact it's had uh, all over the world, but also, the connotations and the kind of impact it has on individual soldiers when they come when they return and i think all that's uh, something to be mindful of because gary there's a lady there and second question anybody hi um my name's karen uh, tom thanks for that it's not really a question it's a comment on what we had from richard carney yesterday and what tom has just read for us now and i think two things that richard mentioned yesterday were the big traumas and what he called the little traumas the very public, large traumas that are experienced by you as a witness in Lebanon and the personal trauma that you have experienced as Tom Clonan. And I think what you've just read encapsulates the two of these things. And I think in terms of writing trauma and in terms of the question Fia asked Richard yesterday, how does the Abbey commemorate a nation's trauma and how we commemorate what we perceive as our traumas? We have to remember, like Richard said yesterday, this transgenerational memory. And how we commemorate that is also encapsulated in what Tom has spoken about now. We have to remember the personal, but we also have to remember our responsibilities as a nation. And I think the important thing there is that we accept the scars, we bear witness to them. I was in Palestine myself and I met Hadaf Suif during last year and I said to her that when I left the West Bank I felt guilty that I was actually leaving the place. And she said, but you were there. And that is the important thing, that people know that you were there. And I think what we have to do in our commemoration is say, our people were there, we are here now, we acknowledge them, we acknowledge their trauma, but also we want to leave the scars as witness for the next generation. No tidy ends. And that's what I think we should commemorate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Gentlemen here. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, can I just say uh, thank you for your service to the nation as well um, and for sharing that, that uh, touching story. Um, as somebody who's experienced um, conflict firsthand um, and has worn a uniform, do you, now that you're out of the service and um, as we're heading towards this, this decade of commemoration, do you at all become disillusioned with the political system in the way it still ends up in conflict? Consider, uh, considering the fact that the conflict that we will be commemorating um, will indefinitely... Uh, can no longer speak. Undoubtedly, thank you, <laughs> uh, Undoubtedly, become politicised um, between uh, the, the the showing of different banners and that um, going forward. And um, do you feel um, having having worn the uniform? Do you feel um, uh, disillusioned with the, with the political process? Um, and Fiac, if you'd like to answer as well, that'd be great. Thank you. Well, I mean, having been in three separate conflicts, obviously in Ireland prior to the ceasefires, and and the story of the troubles has yet to be told. I mean, in, in Northern Ireland, um, the British Army, uh, their MI5, 
um, loyalist paramilitaries, Republican paramilitaries that are telling their stories, writing plays, what have you. Um, but in the Republic, very little has been released. So the mm. story of the Troubles is yet to be told, and I think that's something uh, be a great job for somebody now. <laughs> I think <laughs> to, he's pitching a story, story there. Yeah. Um, uh, because that was a dirty conflict, and the, the security services of the Republic played a very active role in it, and nobody knows about it. It hasn't been, hasn't been spoken about. I also served in Bosnia and, and in the Middle East, and I'll try to be as brief as I can. For me, uh, the, having experienced conflict and warfare, particularly in the urban environment, the people who suffer are civilians. Soldiers are administered and fed in the field. Their, their attrition rates are quite low. But civilians suffer horrifically, men, women, and children. And I suppose the story of 1916, the narrative, I, I may stand corrected on this, but I think the vast number, the majority of those killed in 1916 were, were civilians caught in, in the crossfire. And I think dozens of children were killed. But I think the, the story that women play in conflict is, is not properly understood and it isn't included in the narrative. If I, if I had a criticism of, of war, my primary criticism would be directed at, at journalists like myself and my colleagues in media who perhaps are seduced by you know, the sexy language of conflict, you know, weapon systems and so on, and don't necessarily look uh, beneath the surface at the impact that conflict has on um, on civilians in, in, in the urban environment, which is where conflict is, is fought now. And uh, it's unspeakable. So, sorry for no more questions, but I think it was worth listening to uh, extracts from Tom's uh, writing, and I'm sure we'll hear more from him, and I'm sure he'll be working with us in the future as well. So, give him a great round of applause, and thank you very much. <coughs> thank you.